<laughs> All right. Shall we? Sure. All right. Well, good evening, folks. I'm Elijah McEwen here beside Phil Hoffman. We're here at North on 29, right outside Carleton Place, Ontario. And today we've got with us an act performing here tonight, the one and only Hoxley Workman. Hello. Hello. Welcome to LBC. Th thank you. What does LBC stand for? Live Between Commercials. Ah, okay, that's what we are. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. what we all are. We, exactly. Yeah. Uh, we're not a fireplace here today. Oh, yeah. That's just oh, a lovely like fireside chat. Lively. Yeah. Oh, I feel special today. <laughs> <laughs> it feels really like, yeah. It's a the, lovely uh, Saturday <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> In Ontario, nice winter day. Very it's cold outside. Nice to be inside. Yeah. We're getting a winter loot in Ottawa, I think. Yeah. And here we are. <laughs> inside in Carlton Place. Exactly. So, Hoxley, you got a new album coming out here soon. Yeah. Do I ever? You're the first one that I've even mentioned anything about that. Another record. Because that's what the world needs. It, yeah. Well, they were one music. shy, and I thought, well, <laughs> I'm pretty much ready to come in and save the day, so I got a record in me. And so, what can we expect from that? Oh, it's a pretty good record, to be honest with you. I just, it just was sort of finished, and literally this week, final mixes were coming in, and uh, I, there's some songwriting, and there's some song making, and there's some just, I think the record was a real chance for me to try and feel wild, you know? I think with Mounties, the other rock band I started in the last couple of years, I really felt a renewed vigor when it came to putting energy into music, and this is record number 15, I think, or 16, and, you know, it's, that's a lot of records, that's a lot of time spent, you know, in a silly business called the music business, and so, but the record will come out in May, and we're already getting a full summer of festivals, and the big Canadian tour will happen in the fall, which is crazy, like, I don't know when people started making plans so far in advance, but it feels like it just was fall, and then now I'll be out on the road in fall. Ugh. I know. Is it different now dealing with it than it was as you were starting out? You, you mean emotionally dealing with it? And the you know the business the aspect business to it, it too. Being more experienced. Oh yeah. Business. Well, the business has changed so much as you as ever you know that's sort of well known that the music industry has suffered all sorts of growing pains exactly. with this new digital revolution that sort of led to proliferation of readily available downloading and then now we're entering into a whole new realm of, um, of thievery called uh, music streaming and so yeah it's interesting I think that the longer you, you spend in the business the more you realize that you know your resilience is really everything and your willingness to kind of keep positive about the changing atmospheres and, and, and a willingness and a readiness to stay adaptable because I think you know what we've seen with the with the the record companies is they were absolutely these chunky cumbersome things that had no ability to move or change with the times so yeah I think as artists you know staying nimble and kind of feeling positive and keeping an open mind about how to proceed that's sort of how I think that's how the wise ones are moving forward and has there been times where it's been difficult to make those uh, adaptations to change with the industry? It's definitely tiring. Like, I think that a lot of the people in the business sort of feel like, like, you know, we're throwing our hands in the air because it's not just been about one chain. It's not like, oh, you know, we were the manufacturers of cassette tapes and then now, you know, we had a good run of, you know, 18 years and now there's this thing called the CD and it will have another good run of 18 or 20 years. You know what I mean? I think in the last 10 years there's been, you know, a half dozen format changes, a half dozen or more, you know, different um, attempts to create, you know, models that somehow make some business sense. And so well, I think what I guess I'm getting at is that in 10 years we've just seen a lot of upheaval and a lot of constant and steady change. So I think in a way the folks in the music business have not really had a chance to settle. So it's almost like no one has had the opportunity to sit you know, on, on the couch and get fat, waiting for whatever the next sort of upheaval in the business has been. It's been a, a constant uh, decade of upheaval. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I think what I noticed for the, a lot of the folks who are surviving, and I sort of consider myself somewhat of a survivor, is that we've all stopped complaining about it because what was, you know, 
what was at the time appeared to be the big problem has now in hindsight turned into the red herring and it's been a lot of that. Like, you know, I, everybody was up in arms about one thing for a while and then it was another thing and then it was another thing and then it was another thing and like I say now, I think we're all sort of waiting to see how the cookie crumbles on this streaming thing. And, you know, admittedly, I'm kind of a, I'm, I'm not interested in progress all that much. So all of these newfangled ways of trading music, it, uh, none of it makes me excited at all. But that's because I'm more excited about people and about people's ideas and about growth and about, I don't know, trying as a, as a species to just get a little bit smarter and a little bit more uh, uh, compassionate. And so, um, touching on the, the growth and stuff, uh, and working with people, uh, do you think working on your new album, uh, after working with Mounties, mm -hmm. uh, has that brought a new level to the new album? Totally. I mean, I, I, I made the record with Steve Bass, who's one of my guys in Mounties, and, and Ryan Dahl played on it as well, but it was really, um, I think I took that exuberant, childlike, boyish excitement that I've been able to sort of finagle out of this whole Mounties experience and channel it into new music. I don't think you, 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 get, you expect that, you know, when you're middle-aged, everything in the entertainment business is telling you you're too bloody old and too bloody funny looking, so get out of the way and let the new 18-year-old pretty person <laughs> in. Because it's a, you know, it's a visual-based medium. Yeah. So anyway, um, for some reason or another, I've been given this opportunity to feel all fresh and brand new again. And um, I'm hoping that that's how cycles just go. You know, I think that everybody has cycles in their life, whether it's cycles in your marriage or relationship cycles with your job or with your family. Like, there's always um, high points and low points and I sort of feel right now I'm in a real love affair with the music business again and with my own music and and two you know with making with writing the musical the God that comes a few years ago and I toured the heck out of that for the last couple of years too and kind of that continues to take me around the world and this year it's slowed a little bit but we're still doing a good few weeks of it and it's looking like we'll go to New Zealand Australia and maybe Hong Kong yeah, it's weird. It's weird being a 40-year-old man in, a, in an 18-year-old man's business and still feeling like I've got something to say, you know? And I think that's why we all are so interested, like when a guy like Neil Young or Bruce Coburn or Leonard Cohen or anybody who's sort of been around a while still puts out records or, you know, writing or music or whatever, and it's like, wow, it's interesting to hear what, I mean, I don't, you know, if I was to turn on much music as much as I grew up with much music and love it. It's not that music, the music that's on that TV show is not really aimed at me, it's aimed at a younger audience. And all the advertising that goes along with it is aimed at a younger audience. And so it's neat to hear what old men are saying, because I'm fast becoming one. So as the last decade has gone on, you've had a chance to, you know, produce for some great Canadian artists. Yeah. You know, the Jeremy Fishers of the world, the yeah. great big C's, you know. I don't know why I'm pluralizing them. They're just, <laughs> yeah. but you know what I mean. They loom so large, it feels like there's more than just one of them. It, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so what has that been able to bring to you, being able to work alongside other great musicians? Well, I'm really lucky like that. And um, when I started out, I started out as a drummer, wanting to be a drummer for hire. When I was a kid, that's all I dreamed of doing. I practiced and practiced to become a great drummer. and. When I moved to Toronto, you know, it became quick to, quickly clear that I wasn't, you can't make a living in the music business just doing one thing. So I realized I really had to keep my mind open and try to stay as diversely uh, busy as I possibly could. And, but I think as a drummer, I got to work alongside a lot of interesting people. And in those early days, producing records and working alongside, whether it was Sky Diggers, or in those early years, Tegan and Sarah, or Jason Collette. A lot of the, I worked alongside a lot of the broken social scene folks, and Bru um, uh, John Southworth and Spooky Rubin and Paul McLeod, and all these incredible songwriters. So I really think that I, um, it was a real blessing to be able to have a little quiet position 
in alongside these really, really gifted people. And it allowed me to be right up close to them and see their processes and to, to really smell the essence of their struggles and all creative struggles and, and business-wise and stuff. But I think it allowed me to quietly be the drummer and watch with a bit of distance. And yeah, I was really grateful. I'm grateful for those early years. I was really lucky to spend a lot of time beside some pretty clever people. Well, some of, I think, a lot more clever than me, so. I think it's a shame how little attention the Canadian music realm gets in the, you know, the la large scheme of the world, because we've got great musicians here mm -hmm. who just don't get the recognition they deserve out there, and it's a, it's a true shame in the uh, Well, it's just kind of what it is, you know, yeah. like, Canada is a pretty small place when you judge it by its human population and um, the thing with the human population is they're the only ones with you know with recognized currency to spend on things <laughs> like you know nights out and exactly. record albums and concerts and stuff so you know Canadians have never been we've never had the population to support um, you know massive growing industries we it's no surprise that you know Walmart didn't come from Canada. And, you know, big corporate thinking isn't what isn't necessarily what Canadians do. So, as much as we're filled with a, you know the country's filled with lots of talented people, our essence isn't sort of filled with the same kind of um, what intensified commercial. Uh, Oh. <laughs> intensified commercial uh, uh, intensive. drive. Yeah, that's what I mean. <laughs> so where, where we have all these smart people making music, we just don't have the business, the business machine in place. And yeah. so, you know, the, the UK and America will always sort of lead the, they'll always lead the way. And do you think that uh, since Canada doesn't have that like big corporate mindset, there's kind of adds a certain charm to it, like the to four musicians that have to, they work harder than, and they, like, they know all of the different ways then. Yeah, I think that there's some truth to that. I mean, uh, in our, in Canada, we have some socialized help for musicians, and there's, there's, you can apply for grants from, you know, a handful of different government institutions, both on a federal and provincial level, and so there is help for Canadian musicians who maybe wouldn't be able to make it quite a go of it, but I do think that if, if you are a fan of a Canadian musician, you have to probably know in your gut that they have spent a long time suffering through all, you know, all manner of bumps and bruises, so they're a resilient type person. <laughs> so this, uh, this episode that we're working on with LBC, this is our Oscar special. Oh wow. And uh, yeah, we're, you know, let's glorify that a little more. Sure. Um, yeah, why not? <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't get enough attention. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> but really, you've had the chance to work in a couple of movies. You, we've got Score, we've got Still Mine. Oh, yeah. Can you tell us the experiences that went along with those? Well, uh, making movies is pretty interesting. They move really, really slow. Uh, there's a lot of people involved. Um, it's very fascinating and strange. And uh, yeah, I mean, Canadian film is interesting too, I guess. For me, I got to, on the score movie, I got to, I wrote a lot of the soundtrack, or, or at least a quarter of it, I think. And then just by being around, they thought it might be fun to put me in the movie, and then that when I did the Still Mine movie, I had had like a few different scenes that most of the scenes I was in got cut except for one little bit of one, and so that's interesting when you show up for a day and do stuff like when you're the thing you do is not ended up yeah. doesn't end up being used yet. Yeah. In music, we don't have that very much. Like in movies, it's a lot about going out and gathering as many beaver pelts as you can and hoping that you're going to be able to piece together, you know, a garment large enough to keep you warm for winter, whereas in music, like, you're building with this sort of incremental approach where you're hearing how the song evolves with everything you add. It's like, well, I add one more guitar and then the song gets that much deeper, add another voice, and then all of a sudden the landscape of the, the sonic landscape starts to 
evolve into a way that you can really, you know, you can see grow as it happens. Where the movie, like, you do all of this reconnaissance and then you put it all together at a later date. And so I think a lot of the times, I think that be, having seen the process of movies now, when you see a, a real bad movie with that all by all accounts should have been good, good yeah. cast, seemingly good writing, seemingly decent directing. I think that there's just so much going on, so many balls to juggle, such a slow process, so much happening without you being able to take a full inventory of what you have. And then I think that's why, you know, movies that on paper look like they should be good can go so disastrously wrong. Is that you don't really get to see it happening. It's all, all after the actors have all flown home and everybody, all of the crew has all moved on to a new job. I think you're sitting there with the director and some editors going, wow, like we missed a lot of stuff. Or, oh my God, this movie just by accident has exceeded, you know, its potential from a writing perspective or a directorial perspective because we somehow captured all this magic. I think film is interesting in that way. I think it could kind of go either way when all is said and done. I have to tell you though, my brother loves score with all his heart. <laughs> it is his favorite movie. He's in the one of, I think he's one of like six or seven people who saw it, so that's pretty neat. <laughs> he, he and I watch it every time I babysit him. I've probably watched the movie 25 times. And he sings along to every song. He loves that movie. It's so crazy. Oh, he'd be really excited. <laughs> that's really amazing. You know, when I finally saw the film, and like surprisingly, it opened the Toronto Film Festival, like, I want to say four years ago, maybe it was five. And sitting there watching the movie for the first time, excuse me, and even hearing like the soundtrack fully produced for the first time, it was it was funny and a real interesting. <laughs> like yeah. I could hear all of the songs I'd written, yeah, because I know I knew them more from what my you know habitual tendencies are more than that. I actually remember the songs. It was like typically I, that would be. A, pro a harmonic progression I would use. Yeah. It sounds like, yeah, that sounds like me. And <laughs> they'd kind of go by, and it's a pretty interesting thing, a, a thing to be a part of. Uh, what was the approach to making the music for it, like as opposed to making like an album for yourself, to making it it's contributing to a soundtrack? Well, the, the big one of the big ones for me is because I'm such a lyric guy, and and approach songwriting from putting the lyrics almost at, above the music was that um. All the lyrics were all written by the guy who wrote the film, Mike yeah. McGowan. And so some of them I thought were, you know, quite nice and, and literate and stuff, but they were written from somebody who doesn't have to consider what if how what a tr what a trouble troublesome kind of task it is to take cumbersome language and make it musical. Yeah. So he, I think the, the language that he wrote was perfectly literate and good if you were just reading it as prose, but I think to, to, to have turned them into songs was tricky. And so that presented an interesting challenge, I guess, to take lyrics that weren't innately musical and try to make them sound like songs, yeah. because they were supposed to be sung in the end. Yeah. So relating back to the new album coming out, throughout you know your career, you had a lot of different um, yeah, influences and sounds. How yeah. would you relate this one to you know your past? If we could compare it to something, uh, what would you say it sounds the most like? Well, I sent it off to my trusted, long-time trusted um, radio guys the other day, and the word back from them was they said it's a true to form Hoxley Workman record, except more consistent. Which, from what I can sort of from, from where I'm coming from, it sort of feels like it goes back to Delicious Wolves days. It's, it's a little bit sassy, it's definitely precocious, but definitely is filtered through, you know, a 40-year-old guy's head in, in, in a lot of ways, but also somebody who feels pretty, uh, pretty free with music. And I think it is rowdy, but I think that there's been a lot of, um, Steve put a lot of attention into how the record would would feel as a as a consistent landscape. So I think it sounds like the old me but with a little bit more focus and a little bit more yeah, gravity. And is there a song that over the course of your career you've grown to really just not be able to play it anymore live, you know, it's 
a lot of artists have their songs that they just can't stand anymore after totally. time. And what would that be for you? You know, I've always, whenever this question comes up in an interview that I'm watching of some other artist, and I hear them bellyache about how they don't want to play this, they don't want to play that, like, it seemed for a while there I was catching a lot of Shania Twain interviews, and all she was doing was bemoaning her loathsome career and how awful it was <laughs> to be <laughs> her. Or her. Yeah. Oh. And I've always thought, what a... <laughs> you can okay. What a bunch of <laughs> BS. But now that I've had, you know, 15 or 16 years, I must admit there are songs I don't care to play. And they are songs that, you know, paid a lot of my bills. And I must admit, playing strip tease is still some nights it feels really good. And a lot of it is is that it's such a successful recording. Um in so far as the groove is right, and the textures are right, and the parts are right. And I remember writing and recording that song and knowing right away, it was like, I feel this is gonna make me money, like I just feel it. And I feel like we've never nailed it live, and in, for that reason, it, it's always been a bit of like a, all right, let's play the song that people know, except it's gonna not ever quite, it's one of those, I always feel like my career has, been a lot of people saying like it'd be so cool if you could capture what you do live and put it on record and me going oh god <laughs> again and then there's these few moments where the recordings are far superior to what I can do live and I think that's one of those ones where it's not that I have like like it's like satisfaction I just played it too much it's that the recording seems to live terminally as a more successful piece of output than whatever we try to do it live and so I'm just it's more frustration like Jeepers, we, we, you know, we phoned in a B minus again on that one. I'm like, ugh. Striving for that A plus. Yeah, always. Do you have a, a process before a show to like help keep each song that you play feel fresh each time you do it? You know, I think what it is is I've 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 put a band together and and, and a lot of them have been with me from day one and they know that I like to improvise and they know that I don't like to be held to playing the songs as they were recorded and I talk a lot on stage. I just try and be as irreverent with the music and try and make every night feel individual and special and every night in front of a new audience trying to never, you know, play things or say things the same way twice and that's really I think what keeps my my road sanity alive is that I'm just devoted to wanting every night to feel different. And I would love to say that that's because I want the audience to feel that, but it, is, it has more to do with, with me growing rapidly uninterested in myself with every passing day, you know? And so it's like, I was pretty boring to myself 10 years ago, and fast forward 10 years, it's like, whoa, like, it's not getting any more interesting. <laughs> So we've got a new album coming, festival circuit coming, you know, Fall tour, tour coming. Yeah, the new record I'm really excited about. It's called Old Cheetah. It's got 11 songs on it, and I don't know. I've never spent this long without a new record either. For a long time, I was putting two records a year out, which, you know, everybody around me loathed that. Like all my business partner people were all like, "Ah, they're you're making everybody sick," and it's like, I know, but I have nothing else to do, so. It's been three or four years, it's pretty neat. New record, tour, exciting, excitement. It's a crazy time. Push-ups, yeah. yeah. Oh. <laughs> and so what? <laughs> oh. How can you not be? <laughs> <laughs> so what comes next after that fall tour ends? Where do you see yourself going from that point forward? Oh, I imagine Mounties will be well into making their next record and um, I must admit, I, I have a children's book in the works as well that... Um, and when can we expect that? Well, it's a, I've heard that it's going to come out December of this year, which is December 2015. Um, yeah, I've been really cozy with all these projects lately, giving structure to my future. And I think when the old Cheetah Touring comes to to a close, whatever that will be, late this year or early into the next year, then I'm going to have to come up with something new to do. And who knows, my brother and I have been talking about making, having a landscaping company, so maybe 
Maybe that. I love cutting the grass. I love, like, I had to cut down our rose bush this year because it was just getting so unruly and there's these copulating bugs on it. And so it could be that. I really like running. I'd like to do more. I hope that this, this summer, I really, last year my running, I only ever really got it up to about 65%. I'd really like to get it up to 85, 90 this year. Well, that's all you can ask for, right? That's true. Well, well thank you, Oxley. For thank great, you, you guys. Great day. Thanks for coming out in the snow. Take no care. Oxley, we're good. North of 29? <laughs> North of 29. Take care, everybody out there at Kajiko Land. And more <laughs> local TV. Don't give in to mass-produced entertainment products. This is the truth. The other stuff is a lie. Trust me. I am the truth. <laughs> <laughs>